Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 2002 release May. This one is done by Lucky McKee and that means written and directed by Lucky McKee. Now this is the first time I'm seeing this film. Uh, it's one of those films that's just been on my list for a long time. If you would be able to see my list of films I need to watch, it's insanely long. So there are a lot on there that have been there for a while and this is one of them. But I'm very glad I finally got around to it. Like I said, written and directed by Lucky McKee. He's also done such films as The Woods, Red, The Woman, All Cheerleaders Die, Blood Money, Kindred Spirits, and most, re most recently, Death Sember, which I haven't heard anything about Death Sember since it, I think it came out. Uh, it's the most recent one. Now, I have to say this up front at the top before I really get into the film, Angela Bettis did a wonderful job in this as the character of May. She, her performance is great. You believe her performance. You believe that's who she is in this film is exactly who was scripted, and it comes off very well. She also ended up showing up in Lucky McKee's film The Woman as well, playing a character in that. So very cool that they were then able to work together again. Uh, there was initially a long introduction within this film of May as a child, which ended up in the end being cut for what's there now because they felt like it kind of took the film a bit too long to actually get going. So things really got cut down. So what you see in the very beginning as the establishing information about who May is really mainly just to show how lonely she is and her relationship with dolls as opposed to human beings in the beginning. Um, that was a lot longer at one point, apparently. But I think whatever what they ended up shaving it down to, I mean, obviously, I didn't see what was there before, but what they shaved it down to certainly plays well for me. Uh, I think it gives you the necessary information to understand who May is as a person starting everything out. It gives you all that backstory you need without giving you a lengthy amount of backstory to sit through. So I think they did a good job with that. Um, the original scene of... Her meeting Blank, that's actually the name of the character, uh, Duvall's character, the guy who was also from Donnie Darko, um, who had the Frankenstein tattoo on his arm and the wild hair. Um, originally, May's introduction to him in the film, when that happened, she wasn't very, like, kind of cold and withdrawn. What she was is she was, like, angry and yelling at people as they walked by her in the streets. So I do think that's kind of a big difference uh, ch change-wise for the film because... The way she was, it made her seem more approachable, how it was in the film, versus how it was originally written, where it would be probably a little bit less believable that Blank would end up being interested in actually, you know, talking to her all that much or, you know, trying to go to her place. Uh, yeah. So May's level of being ostracized is very effectively shown in that beginning sequence, uh, you know, not just because of... Uh, the, the whole, her whole eye situation, which, you know, something like that when, when it's a child and they have a big difference from all the other children, like you immediately assume that there's an ostracization, ostracization, if that's a word. Um, I do, I know I do when I watch it in film because, you know, growing up as a kid, that's what you experience, whether it's you personally or you seeing it with other kids, you know, if there's something different, like significantly different, like the situation with May's eye when she's a kid, uh, that gets picked on. Kids are very mean, and uh, they do a good job of setting that up with this one. You can see after her eye appointment that May's mood actually gets very upbeat and hopeful. It kind of sets the tone for where she is in a mental state to start with the film. You get the backstory on how, you know, her, how traumatic things have been for her, and then you get... Uh, an introduction into the story where she's actually at a high point, uh, especially like I was talking about after that eye appointment where it kind of like sets her eyes straight. So she's starting to feel a little bit more, more normal. She's feeling more self-confidence, more self-esteem, and she just emits this upbeat attitude. For, obviously from there, it's this kind of very gradual deterioration that takes her all the way down to where we end up with, where, where we end up being in the very end of the film. Uh, when the guy came into the vet talking about his dog missing a leg, I actually thought May was going to end up having something to do with that missing leg. Now, I don't know if that's actually what was going on. There wasn't anything specifically that was in there, but um, 
it was just another one of those hints, I feel like, at the parts aspect of the film. Because if you look at it, there's a, the, it focuses on parts a lot. I mean, the film begins with the falling uh, baby doll pieces, body pieces, which is obviously a very strong indicator of where the film is going in the end. But also, it's a showing of the mindset of May herself because she thinks in terms of parts. One of the things being uh, she does because of, you know, the introduction of who she was as a child and how basically her friends were dolls in essence and she was making her friends, literally making her friends uh, as a child by making these dolls. Uh, but also when you're seeing her interact with people within the film, notice that when it's kind of from her point of view and she's interacting with people, it's looking at specific pieces of the people. It's not looking at the person as a whole. It's like looking at their hand or their elbow or their or their entire head is actually one of them as well. But just notice that it's focused on pieces just like she focuses on pieces of the dolls who were her friends. So in real life, all she knows is the pieces to look at of the human beings. But that's also a foreshadowing of where things are going in the end of her taking those pieces that she's observing of these people and admiring of these people and put, throwing them all together to make a friend. Make friends. Yeah, so anyway, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. When May starts rubbing her face on Adam's hand, that's a clear sign to the audience that things are off. Uh, for how withdrawn May is as a person, that's an unbelievably odd move and bold move to be making out in public, especially with someone you don't actually know. Yes, she's been watching Adam for quite some time, but he doesn't know her at that point. So for her to just go up and start rubbing her face on his hand while he's kind of sleeping or trying to sleep uh, is a very bold thing. And that indicates you've already seen that she's pretty withdrawn. She's very apprehensive about kind of approaching to people and talking with people and she's awkward um so you get that feeling something's not right here for her to take that bold step and start wiping her face on his hand because it's kind of like she isn't there mentally when that happens and then she kind of like snaps too when he catches her doing it the amount of time spent with may and how her personality unfolds really does endear you to her i found myself really rooting for her uh and wanting things to kind of go well for her in this film. Even when the weird things are happening, even when you get the idea that things are going down the wrong road, even when you know she's capable of killing people, there's still something about the way her character is built and the things that happen to her and the things that, you know, you see of her personality that makes you still like her and make you still root for her. And I think a lot of that actually has to do with the the roots in the loneliness of her childhood. I also think it has a lot to do with the fact that there are a lot of people who have experienced kind of lonely childhoods like this, or people who have seen people or know people who have experienced lonely childhoods like this. So it is easy to see yourself in May a little bit or someone you know or are very intimate with in your life. So just saying. The story May tells of the old man's dog having its guts burst all over the place is a huge warning at this point. It's an awkward scene and Adam seems to be freaked out while May is finding joy in telling this story. That is just another one of those little breadcrumbs that's laid out throughout the course of the film of something's wrong. But it's also part of the um, destabilization. Of, of May as a person. She's got it pretty well together. She's keeping things together. She wears this facade when she's interacting with other people, but there are these cracks that show up in that facade. And that story, telling that story is one of those. Uh, the facade has come down at that point. She starts to feel a little more comfortable around Adam. So she starts being herself more and herself is what doesn't fit into normal society. Herself is what can't interact normally with other people and will scare those people away. And you see that a little bit of a repulsion by Adam in that moment. And that's just one of those moments that does that in the film, specifically with Adam. The overbearing nature of May moves up a level when she tells Adam she's never had a boyfriend, then makes him feed her a chip that was dipped in salsa, then takes his arm for him and puts it around her. That is just another one of those moments I was talking about that kind of moves it up 
another notch, moves it up another notch, and is another warning sign that something is off here. So honestly, the fact that Adam keeps coming back as much as he does might not be all that believable within the context of the story with how many things are going on, but that is tempered a little bit in the story with showing with uh, when they show his his film project and kind of the decoration of the apartment he's living in because it shows you that he's a little weird like and, and maybe he's just attracted to that so that does temper it a little bit but prior to that you're kind of like I don't know if it's believable that this guy keeps wanting to see this girl because there are some very clear signs that she's off. Very unnerving when Adam uses the fake knife on May and she doesn't react negatively to it. In fact, it actually excites her and that's when she starts kind of like playfully making the stabbing motion with his hand on her and then doing it back to him as if it's almost a sexual thing in a sense. And it actually does seem to be kind of a foreplay thing with her that leads to, you know, the kissing and then things go wrong because he's like, where'd you learn to kiss? What's going on? Uh, so yeah, I just found that interesting. Just another one of those indicators. The Jack and Jill video that Adam shows, which is his project, uh, May thinks it's funny and, and fun. And I love when May says it's far-fetched that Jill got Jack's whole finger bit off in one mouthful. Um, that was funny. I mean, and there is a dark comedy that, that carries throughout this whole film. It's interesting because it's upbeat and fun and interesting and endearing and a very charming film, but at the same time, it's funny, and at the same time, it's disturbing, and it's just like, it's so many things rolled into one that the writing had to be exactly right to get all those feelings to go together, and that's why I think it's, it's a strong film. When May kills the cat with the ashtray, which I do not like, by the way, just because, you know, I'm a cat lover, I have one, uh, it's indicating to the audience that she's capable of murder. So most likely, if a person is not next, at some point, a person will happen. You know, when little things like this happen in film, that is supposed to be that indicator to the audi audience. This person has just committed murder on some level. They are capable of murdering a human being. And obviously, that's where it ends up going with multiple human beings. The part with the kids crawling on the glass and taking the doll apart is pretty disturbing. Yeah, especially with the music that they had of the little kid's voice doing like the la la la, that type thing. That, by the way, whenever that shows up in the film, that music is disturbing. It's just disturbing. It's one of those universally disturbing things that when there's music with kids' voices like that, it's always going to hit you that way pretty much. Uh, I do think that particular scene, scene doesn't feel super right just because it's off in the sense that the kids would not just crawl on the ground knowing that there's broken glass there. And even when they start doing that, they wouldn't continue. So it doesn't feel realistic in that sense. But to some degree, it does feel like it's all in May's mind, which to a degree, maybe it is just in her mind at that point. Although, you know, the doll is all, you know, broken apart and she is covered in blood. So I initially thought, well, this has got to be fake because the kids wouldn't react like this, but I don't think it is within the events of the film. So that doesn't feel super realistic, but it's an effective scene nonetheless. And like I said, quite disturbing. So I like it. Blank's line about it be, being so hot that he needs ice for his nipples made me laugh, and I was watching this by myself, so that is a big achievement. This goes back to the dark humor thing. Actually, that's not a dark piece of humor. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's not a dark piece of humor. It's just humor uh, amongst a film filled with dark humor. But that was hilarious. He's like, oh, you got any ice for my nipples? <laughs> so funny. Uh, it kind of felt out of place for a minute, but it was just funny enough that you know, I didn't really care. May's comment on Blank's uh, Frankenstein's monster tattoo is a hint for where May is headed. Like I was saying, just another one of those hints that shows you, much like the doll parts in the beginning, uh, her obsession with sewing and patchwork and putting that together, which her clothing is patchwork together as well. It's all about taking pieces and putting it together. The Frankenstein's monster tattoo, the fact that when she looks at people, she just looks at some singular parts of them, all that stuff rolling together to indicate to you she will be making her own Frankenstein's monster. 
Note that once May has decided to collect body parts, her personality changes, and she makes herself look like the doll that came that was behind the glass. She is now the doll, and she's no longer awkward. She decides, she makes a confident decision at that point, and she's back to kind of what she was in the beginning, feeling very confident, feeling self-esteem. At that point, she knows what she has to do. She no longer is interested in fitting herself into society. She is interested in fitting a friend into her life, which for her, what makes sense is taking the pieces of people that she likes or pieces that she likes of people and putting them together into one person that she can like the entirety of instead of just a piece of that person. Because the entire time she's just liking pieces of people. In the end, she puts them all together to create the whole person that she actually likes. Granted, they're not actually alive, but yeah. Even when May tries to stop fitting into other people's lives and tries to fit them into hers, she still is not seen. And that's what happens in the very end. You know, even when she does take the steps to create her own person uh, by taking all those body parts and sewing them together, and then even eventually going to the lengths where she takes her own eyeball out and puts it on that person she put together, um, it still doesn't satisfy what she's looking for because it's not alive. Because she wants to be recognized and seen by someone. And a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people have been there. Like, how often in your life have you felt like you want someone to recognize something you did or who you are as a person or how hard you worked doing this or doing that in life? And no one's saying anything. No one's looking at it. No one's acknowledging you. And this is getting to that in a much exaggerated way, obviously, but it speaks to something very human and something that a lot of people have experienced to varying degrees. So I, that's another part of why this film hits the way it does and why it's so important to watch. I do think the end is drawn out a bit too long and the hand touching her at the end I think was very unnecessary. I don't think you need that because obviously it's not alive. I assume that was kind of a in her head type thing. But it, it just wasn't necessary. It wasn't needed. I actually think the film plays a lot better if you don't move the hand at all in the end. I think it's a much more powerful image if she just dies next to that uh, Frankenstein's monster that she, she has created after she takes her eyeball out. Just have her bleed out and die with it. I think that's a better ending. The film feels very much of the era of something like Cruel Intentions or Clueless, uh, not just the feel of, you know, a, a person in the world trying to adapt and, and being young, but also kind of the look of it. It looks from that era as well, stylistically. May is constantly commenting on parts of people like parts of a doll, which is seen in scenes in the introductory sequence. Just another connection there. Also notice that a lot of shots done from May's perspective are focused on just parts of people. Uh, and that's what she seems to be interacting with uh, primarily. Uh, the doll behind glass seems to be a representation of May, trying to keep her darker self confined. But as the cracks in the glass start to appear and become larger, so do the cracks in her social facade and the cracks in her mental health and holding it together. So notice that. The the going between of her and the doll in the glass is really a showing of her mental state and her holding things together within society. And as that cracks, you see the cracks in her life, and then once it shatters, it all falls apart. So I like that, that uh, metaphor in there. Overall, the film has this palpable charm to it, even when things are often disturbing. Some of that is probably from the real messed up dark comedy moments, and another is due to the consistently upbeat soundtrack. Yes, I was very interested to see, to well, sorry, to see, to hear that there was a really pretty consistently upbeat soundtrack, especially for such ma dark material. And as someone is devolving and just falling apart, you would think it would have gotten darker. You think it would have been more serious, but it's not. But I like that about it. It really does work. And I feel like it keeps you more engaged and it keeps you more, it keeps you from getting too depressed about the film and viewing it in a more fun manner and taking it a little bit with a grain of salt. From a young age, people are, people are told to make friends. Uh, this is that piece of encouragement taken to a very 
ridiculous level, obviously, but it works. It's done in a great way, and I love that th that was the premise for this film. Make Go make friends. How often were you told as a kid, make friends, go, go outside, make friends? Well, May does that. When she figures she can't get friends to be, people to be her friends, she's like, I will make friends, or make one friend. This speaks greatly to being an outcast and desperately wanting to have others in your life. Uh, a lot of people I know have probably experienced that at some point, not just necessarily with wanting someone to be in your life, but one individual person at some point in your life where you're like, oh, it'd be really cool to, you know, be with that person boyfriend or girlfriend wise or be that person's friend, but they don't have interest. The The feelings are not reciprocated. So this kind of takes that and, and goes further with it. Real good directing in this and a pretty tight script that has really great pacing. May's slow falling apart is very gradual and it feels real for what the story is because it takes its time. I love the pacing in this. That is one of the biggest strengths with it. And like I said, really good directing and very tight script. That's something that doesn't happen a whole lot. There's so many films I watch and I'm like, there's so much extra crap in this that needed to be cut out of the script. And that is not the case here. They, at least if they had extra in the script, they at least edited it down after the fact and made it a very tight story that works really well and has great, 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 great pacing. So overall, this is a very nice film. Uh, it's not the best film I've seen. I can't give it like a five star or anything like that. In the end, I was between four and four and a half. It feels more appropriate at a four, unfortunately. But no, if I was doing quarters, it would be 4.25. So four star rating for May, really good. Uh, makes me want to watch more Lucky McKee stuff. Because other than this, the only other Lucky McKee I've seen was his entry in Masters of Horror um, with the, uh, well, I don't want to ruin it. You should go check it out. Actually, just watch all the Masters of Horror. It's awesome. His is called Sick Girl. And look into that. It's, it's a good time. So, would love to hear what other people have to say about this film, May. I know there are a lot of strong opinions. I haven't heard anything any said negatively about this film when I've talked to people about it, so I'm assuming I'll get a lot of positive comments, so go ahead and put those down there. Do me a quick favor, though. Hit that subscribe button. If you're not a subscriber, I would really appreciate you just taking that one second it takes to hit that because it really does mean a lot to me, and it really keeps me motivated to keep doing these videos because I'm just doing them for people to consume and create a kind of nerdy horror community here where we can talk about horror stuff because where I live, I don't have people like that in my life. I can't I can't talk at a very nerdy depth horror with anyone where I live. So I'm looking for you people. So hit that subscribe. Also hit the notification bell button because then you'll know when I'm putting up new videos like this in-depth review or an unboxing or any of that type of stuff. Um, so yeah. But regardless, I really appreciate you taking your time to watch this video. And until next time, keep it brutal.